Legend says that as a child, the great warrior Achilles was dipped in the river Styx by his mother to make him invincible. However, she failed to immerse the ankle by which she held him. Despite his seeming invulnerability, the mighty warrior Achilles had a weakness, a fatal flaw that would bring about his ultimate demise. In ancient times, philosophers and scientists struggled to understand their world. Today, that quest continues through observation and experiment. But from the beginning, our observations have always been interpreted through a lens, an already established belief about where we came from. Throughout history, people have often come to conclusions they thought were irrefutable like the idea that the Earth was the center of the solar system, only to have those ideas come crashing down. History shows that mistakes were often made through incorrect interpretations of our world. So, can science really answer the big underlying questions of where did the universe come from? How did it all begin? Can science lead us to the ultimate source of all knowledge? Today, evolution is believed by many to be an unquestionable fact, as impervious to attack as Achilles in his golden armor. But there are scientists today who have looked at the evidence and have come to very different conclusions about where we came from. We're now going to look at the main pillars of evolutionary theory through the eyes of 15 PhD scientists. After closely examining the alleged evidence, they have found fatal flaws. Evolutions, Achilles heels. Most people see natural selection as the main engine of evolution. This supposedly slow and gradual mechanism drives changes in the way species look and behave over time. It's also commonly called survival of the fittest, but that's a little confusing because it's not always the biggest and the strongest who survive. In reality, natural selection is all about reproduction. The organism that had the most descendants in later generations was, by definition, the fittest, and that usually comes about because some variation in the organism helped it to be more suited to its environment than others. So everybody talks about natural selection, and they kind of almost imagine like it's a magic wand. It's an explanation for everything. Natural selection is simply differential reproduction. In all living systems, in all populations, some individuals reproduce more than others. That is natural selection. As an example from my work in soil microbiology, particularly with pesticide degradation, if we add pesticide to a soil system to kill weeds, insects, or diseases, within that bacterial population, there is a portion that can degrade or utilize that pesticide as a carbon or nitrogen source to grow. So that over time, you had a change in this population, but natural selection did not bring about any new features. Uh, it was already in the population. The first time that I 
saw a creation presentation on natural selection, I was just amazed at my blindness prior to that in not realising that natural selection can only operate on whatever is existing and it can only operate to remove what is existing. And so the realisation that it doesn't actually produce new genetic information uh, was an absolute bombshell to me. So natural selection is actually a convenient term to use just to describe this process by which uh, creatures, organisms not suited to the environment are eliminated, those which are suited survive. So natural selection is not the same as evolution. The survival of the fittest does not explain the arrival of the fittest. If natural selection only selects from what's already in the population, then how does evolutionary progress occur? Mutations are the evolutionists hoped for engine of evolution. And if that's true, there should be hundreds of examples that we could see today of mutations increasing the genetic information. Is this Darwinian process, mutation plus selection, is that a creative process? In fact, is that the creative process? And the answer is, it's not a creative process. The mutation selection process is only useful for fine-tuning systems. And that's what we see in biology. If we consider the most common examples of evolution, the ones you see in the textbooks and things, these are not due to some new feature being added, but breaking existing features. For example, uh, warfarin resistance in rats or DDT resistance in mosquitoes, loss of sight in cave fish and cave salamanders, loss of functional wings in beetles on a windy island. In all these cases, things are broken by mutation and natural selection is involved in selecting them. The getting rid of them happens to be adaptive. But people say, hang on, I see new species appearing. Isn't that a proof of evolution? Well, not really, because it's not a problem for a creationist. Both the creation and evolution models predict the appearance of new species. What I mean is that God apparently created animals that were designed to diversify over time. So you, you look at red wolves and gray wolves. Obviously, they're wolves. They came from a common ancestor. But all we would say is that they came from two wolf-like creatures that came off of Noah's Ark. Now, the real problem is defining what a species is. I mean, keep in mind, species, species is the word, it's a man-made word, and boundaries between species are often blurry. Scientists use the word in multiple ways. I mean, it, geologists, they tend to separate fossils into different species based on the way they look. But biologists sometimes say things belong to the same species if they can interbreed regardless of how they look. If you think about it, both sides of the creation and evolution debate predict the formation of new species. Therefore, even though the appearance of new species is necessary for evolutionary theory, it cannot be proof of evolution if the creationist model can make the same prediction. Let me give you another example. I, I've been to the Galapagos Islands. I, I've seen the marine iguanas and the land iguanas. They, they look different, they act different, they live in different environments, they eat different things. They've been labeled as two distinct separate species by the evolutionists, and they claim they've been separated for millions of years. Yet hybrid offspring between the two species exist, and they're easy to find, so they look different, but they can interbreed. Obviously, they came from a single founding species that made it to those islands, but are they really separate species? And it's not just among iguanas. We've seen hybridizations between false killer whales and dolphins, donkeys and zebras, polar bears and grizzlies, lions and tigers. And many of these crosses produce fertile offspring. When Darwin went to the Galapagos, he collected information about finches and he was looking for change over time. It wasn't until quite some time later, thinking about it, he realised the finches he saw there 
probably, almost certainly, were derived from finches on the mainland. But they're just variations of finches. And in fact, today we know that many of them can interbreed, so they shouldn't even be called different species. So this is not an example of evolution in the sense of microbes to mankind. Darwin's basic concept in his tree diagram was a tree of life, that all living things today go back to one common ancestor. But creationists have the idea, our idea is that uh, we can trace things back to basic kinds, not one, but many different basic kinds that were created and they've adapted and speciated and so on to give what we see today. So instead of a tree, creationists see it more of an orchard where each tree in the orchard is a basic kind from which the branches actually are the species and things we see today. And ad adaptation and natural selection are involved in that process. I think that nature has been created to be able to modify itself and fitting the circumstances where living organisms are. We see a lot of variation potential in nature, but real novelties are not there. People talk about different species and speciation in nature. That's something that we can observe, but it is not the same thing as creating novel structures novel information. I don't see that. You can imagine that you have a, a front-loaded organism with all these, these genes, and you can then argue that, okay, in this particular environment, you can lose that part of genes. In the other environment, with, with other selection pressure, with other conditions, you can lose another part, another set of the genes. While it's true that mutations can sometimes create new traits, they generally only work to destroy existing traits and information. So when a new trait called sickle cell anemia arose in Africa, it allowed people to survive malarial infections. It was a new trait, but the hemoglobin gene was broken in the process. Likewise, many examples of antibiotic resistance of bacteria deal with broken genes for transporting things into the cell. The reason that the bacteria can live is because the transporter gene is broken, the poison can't get in. It's easier to break something then to create something new. Natural selection plus mutation actually works in the wrong direction for evolution. So the question is, how does evolution work? Actually, I believe genetics is the most powerful argument against evolution. And, uh, and the reason is that when you, when you look at the genes of things, I mean, they, they're transmitted and passed on generation to generation. But the changes you see, the mutations, actually destroy the genes. What biologist does is actually it studies the genetics, the genetic information, the transfer of genetic information, the control of genetic information, or in my field, biotechnology, how to change that intelligently to create something novel. Darwinism has nothing to do with that. The random approach produces nothing. Randomness cannot uh, compete with intelligence in, in understanding nature. I organized a symposium at Cornell University, and the topic was biological information. And all of the scientists agreed on one thing, and that is that information is fundamental to our understanding of what life is. Information is, in a sense, what makes life life. And I'm not just talking about information like data. I'm talking about information networks, communication networks within the cell. One of the most amazing information transfer systems in the cell involves the way proteins are encoded in and decoded from strands of DNA. Starting out with these long, fragile, sticky strings of DNA, an amazing machine called an RNA polymerase zips down the strand, opens up the coils, and copies the DNA into another molecule called RNA. And RNA uses a slightly different language convention. It still has four letters like DNA, but instead of A, C, G, and T, it has A, C, G, and U. 
The RNA then leaves the nucleus and another amazing machine attaches to it. It's called a ribosome, and it is in charge of translating from the language of the RNA with its four letter bases to the language of proteins with their 20 different amino acids. Three bases on the bottom of the tRNA match to three letter groups in the RNA. On the other end are amino acids which pop off as they're attached to the growing protein strand. But the process isn't finished because most proteins need help folding properly. And that's facilitated by little molecules called chaperones. They attach to and protect the unfolded protein as it's transported to a watermelon-shaped molecule called a chaperonin, which folds the protein into its final form. From DNA to protein is an incredibly complex process that uses precise and complex machines to translate between two completely unrelated languages, the linear code of the DNA world to the three-dimensional code of the protein world. If we look into these complexities and into these codes in the genome and in the, in the, in the working together, the operating system in the cells, then it is very hard to exclude that there hasn't been intelligence behind it. And I think that is what the creationists recognize in these systems. How did this incredible communication network that's even present in the simplest cell, how did it arise? Well, you need three things for it to arise. Number one, you need a language. You can't even conceive of a, a communication system until there's a language because there's senders and receivers in the cell. Secondly, you need uh, communication channels or networks. It's a little bit like the hardware that enables the internet. And thirdly, you have to have meaningful information that is being translated into language and communicated through the channels of communication. Information is at the heart of cellular function. Did you know the cell even has a post office? There are these specialized molecules called kinesins, and they're in charge of delivering packets of material to different parts of the cell. But in their journey, they go to pre-specified destinations. Without that addressing system, the cell couldn't even work. Information, communication, and language. They're non-material entities, they arise through intelligence, and they are mutually defining. So you can't have one without the other. They all have to arise at the same time. Yet the information in the genome is much more complicated than we first thought. In fact, the genome contains multiple levels, multiple dimensions of information. Well, start with the one-dimensional string called DNA. Upon this, there's this huge two-dimensional network of interactions amongst different parts of the genome with each other. Then we have to fold the DNA into a three-dimensional shape that changes shape in the fourth dimension, time. To make it even more complicated, it's now known that most parts of the genome code for more than one thing at the same time. Overlapping codes are almost impossible to improve upon because if you improve one of the codes, you are destroying or disrupting one of the other codes. So what I mean by overlapping codes, of course, is that the same sequence of DNA has more than one message. And that is now very, very clear. Most of these overlapping codes are found in the so-called junk DNA. Since only 2% of the genome actually codes for protein, scientists decided decades ago that the rest is unimportant leftover garbage from our evolutionary history. But that view is now seen to be quite naive. As the genomics revolution has shown that non-protein coding portions of the genome are actually quite active, not for creating proteins, but for creating something similar to DNA called RNA which is one of the cellular workhorses and which often affects the production of protein down the line. The junk DNA also contains lots of other codes for controlling many different functions in the cell. So basically, uh, a lot of scientists now understand that the junk DNA paradigm was profoundly wrong and will be recorded in history as one of the greatest blunders of science and it was driven by an ideological commitment to the Darwinian concept. Similar to the junk DNA myth is the myth that the human and chimpanzee genomes are 98% identical. That figures continue to decrease as we learn more about genetics, and the figure's now much less than the earlier estimates. But the number really doesn't matter, because humans and chimpanzees, they look similar, we behave somewhat similarly, we live in the same environments, we eat the same foods, 
both the creationists and the evolutionists expect them to be similar genetically. Creationists simply believe it's a, due to common design, not common ancestry. Yet, when you consider humans only, it is staggering how similar we all are one to another. And if you exclude recent mutations like sickle cell anemia or hereditary blindness, all those you know, bad things, it would be possible to put all the world's human diversity into a single original human couple. But there's a problem, and it doesn't matter if you're looking at the human genome or the chimpanzee genome or any other genome. And the problem is that the information is degrading and mutations are building up in populations over time. So I've been studying genetic entropy for the last 13 years, and it's a really profound problem, and it's something widely acknowledged by geneticists, and it is the problem that bad mutations accumulate in the human genome. And this is best illustrated by just considering it on a personal level. In your body or in my body, we have about three new mutations every time a cell divides. So this is um, sobering because it's the reason we die. And so the reason that uh, we get old and all of our systems start to break down is because of this mutational process and the accumulation of bad mutations in our genome. It's why there's an upper lifespan. Now, the problem is bigger still, because of course we already know that we're mortal, but we transmit a certain fraction of our mutations to our children, and they add more mutations to it, and then they pass it on to their children, and then they add more mutations still, and they add it to the next generation. So this is a problem not just for people, but for the whole human race. And logically, the human race should be devolving, not evolving. Basically, the human race is degenerating. The human genome is rusting out like a car. Can natural selection solve this problem? No. Think of a room full of people. Now, kill off only the ones with the worst or most obvious mutations. What do you have left? A room half full of people that still have 60 to 100 more mutations than their parents. If everyone is multiply mutant, and if every generation is more mutant than the one before it, all selection can do is slow down the degeneration by killing off the absolute worst of the lot. But it doesn't stop mutations increasing the population over time. So genetic entropy is profound. Not only is it profound because it really has a, impacts us personally and our children and our grandchildren, it's really profound because it is lethal. It is absolutely lethal to genetic evolutionary theory because it means that things are going down, not up. All modern scientific evidence points to the decay and destruction of an original good design. If you like, good information getting worse. But where did this good information come from in the first place? How did life begin? Even under an evolutionary scenario, the first cell would have to have been horrendously complex. The general theory of evolution says that all living things came from a single cell and that cell came from something like a primordial soup. And for me as a chemist, the hardest problem for evolution is the origin of first life from non-living chemicals, and this is commonly called chemical evolution. Most people have heard of the Miller-Urey experiment, and it's in most textbooks still today. They wanted to see if organic molecules could come from inorganic precursors. So they took some simple chemicals and they ran them through spark chamber. And most of the products they got really amounted to nothing more than a brown tar because random chemical reactions produced random molecules. 
And yeah, they found a few amino acids, but in a mixture of left and right-handed forms. But what they didn't find are certain specific amino acids that are critical for life. They didn't find nucleotides. They didn't find any large biomolecules. To get living things, we need lots of huge molecules, and that means we have to get little molecules to combine into big molecules. And the problem is that chemicals don't react in that way. Everything I've learned in real chemistry shows that the reactions go in the opposite way from what's required for life to come from non-living chemicals. Any chemist trying to do that would not have water in the reaction because water tends to drive the reaction in the opposite direction towards the little molecules. And yet the primordial soup would inevitably have loads of water in it. So it's the last place any real chemist would try to make proteins or DNA. Another problem with chemical evolution is called the chirality problem. Now, amino acids in proteins and sugars in DNA come in two mirror image forms, like your left hand and right hand. But all the amino acids in our body are left-handed and all the sugars in DNA are right-handed. Uh, but a primordial suit would have an equal number of both. And it's quite complicated to get a single-handed mixture. And a primordial soup does not have that know-how and therefore it's totally suitable for the origin of life. The most common scenario for the evolutionary origin of life is called the RNA world. Here they imagine an ocean or a lake full of RNA molecules that are able to reproduce themselves and that slowly evolve into the first reproducing organism. The RNA world is a desperate attempt, a last straw, a grasping at nothing, and it is completely unscientific. There's no RNA that can copy itself from its individual building blocks without a protein to help it do that. And so for evolutionists to claim that RNA world is possible is dishonest. To make it even worse, RNA is more unstable than DNA. In your cells, there are about a million DNA breaks every day. Most of those are fixed by the unbelievably intricate and amazing repair systems in the cell. But if RNA is less stable than DNA, and DNA requires exquisite repair systems to survive over time, how on earth can an RNA world be plausible? Also, the building blocks of RNA are threefold. You've got a sugar, a, a base, and phosphate. And naturally, these things don't combine to form the nucleotide bases needed for RNA. So right from the start, you've got a problem in trying to get even the building blocks of RNA and the components of the building blocks are very unstable. Ribose and the bases decompose really quickly. Enzymes are also needed as a catalyst in the cell, and RNA can do this to a very limited extent, which is why the evolutionist appeals to this initial RNA world idea. But the reality is that in living cells, protein-based enzymes do most of the work. So life somehow had to switch from RNA enzymes, for which there is only very limited support, to this incredible protein enzymes. How and when did that occur? An enzyme is a molecule, it's actually a catalyst, that makes a reaction go much faster without being consumed in the process. I mean, there are some very important enzymes essential for life that speed up the reaction uh, by 10 to the power of 18 times, which means a reaction that goes in about a hundredth of a second in living things would take uh, millions or billions of years to happen without the enzyme. So you need these enzymes for life to exist. If natural selection can't explain these enzymes, all evolutionists have is chance. So is the chance feasible? Well, consider even the simplest possible living thing would have to have over 350 enzymes to work. And the enzymes are made of a very precise sequence of amino acids. Now, we could be very generous to the evolutionists and assume only 10 amino acids in each enzyme have to be exact. Now, work out the probability of, say, 350 enzymes with only 10 amino acids each enzyme being exactly right. The chance there is like guessing a 5,000-digit pin the first time. Even a four-digit pin on your bank card is supposed to be enough protection for you, and the bank will tell you if someone um, got it right, you must have left it lying around somewhere. It didn't happen by chance. So how much more a 5,000-digit pin? It's not going to be guessed by chance.
So here's a real chicken and egg problem here because the information in the DNA requires enzymes to read it, but the instructions to build those enzymes are on the DNA, which cannot be read without enzymes. So which came first, the enzymes or the DNA? Most cellular processes, including things like DNA replication and protein synthesis, are powered by a molecule called ATP. And the ATP synthase motor is one of the wonders of the universe. It's a tiny electric motor required by all life. This rotary motor uses protons to generate spin and then uses that to join ADP molecules to phosphate molecules, creating ATP or adenosine triphosphate. All life is based on ATP. It's called the energy currency of the cell and your body produces its own weight of ATP every day. And that motor works at nearly 100% efficiency. ATP is a complex and reactive molecule not found in abiotic systems. Yet without ATP, life could not exist. How did life decide to use that molecule for energy and where did it get it before it could produce it? It's not sufficient to invoke scenarios where I could imagine biochemicals arising spontaneously. Life isn't based upon biochemicals. You can have all the biochemicals you want, and it's not gonna give you life. You can have all the amino acids you want. You can have all the proteins you want. You can add RNA to the soup. You can add DNA to the soup. You can even add membranes to the soup. But number one, they will never assemble into a coherent, correctly assembled cell. And even if they could, you still wouldn't be anywhere near creating life because you have not introduced into those molecules information. Now think about information in the form of books, which is ink molecules written on paper. The information didn't come from the ink molecules. You could pour ink on a page and you would not get a book out of it because the information in the books is the result of a mind organizing those ink molecules into letters and words, sentences and paragraphs. For instance, the simplest living cell, the mycoplasma, has about 600 kilobytes of information. It's like an alphabet. The letters do not say anything at all. It has to be in, a, in the right uh, position and it has to be interpreted. And that is what is going on in, this, in the cells of living beings. You see, there's nothing in chemistry alone that would put any sort of coded information into a molecule. I mean, even if you could get nucleotides to form in a chemical soup, and even if you could get them to form a chain, you'd have nothing but a random string of letters. If you were to wait for a very long time and by chance produce a coherent string with a real instruction, even then it would be just one clear message in a sea of random messages. This is the opposite of what life requires. Life requires lots of information, tightly controlled and protected, able to be copied, able to be fixed when an error appears. And all of this must be present the first time life appears. When the DNA was first decoded, and they, the scientists started looking at the simplest living cell, they imagined that possibly, possibly, we could have a cell with a couple of hundred proteins. Well, it's up to over 400 now. And even the origin of one of these proteins by some chance process, it's not gonna happen even on a universal time scale. And even if every atom in the universe was an experiment for every possible molecular vibration of a supposed billions of years of time, you would never get one protein, let alone hundreds, let alone the DNA to actually code for them. I mean, the idea of the origin of life by natural processes is a preposterous idea, absolutely preposterous idea. Many evolutionists claim that the origin of life is not part of evolution, but come on, they believe that all living things came from a single cell, which in turn came from a primordial soup. So they have to have a theory of life coming from non-living chemicals, otherwise materialism is dead in the water. For evolutionists to believe in chemical evolution, this is not a position they got from science, but a position they got from blind faith. They're basically having to believe in miracles because it's not real chemistry that they can appeal to. You know, evolutionists often accuse creationists of believing in a God of the gaps, where they say that we claim God just did it that way when we run into some process that we don't quite understand. But very often when faced with an unanswerable question, a problem like the origin of life, 
Evolutionists invoke their own Darwin of the gaps. See, everything we know about the laws of chemistry, about genetics and statistics and information theory, argues against any life from non-life idea. But an evolutionist must believe that scientific laws are violated for life to arise from non-living chemicals. That sounds like faith to me. I think one of the biggest challenges for evolution is the origin of the first life. Life supposedly coming forth from a chemical soup. Scientists have had decades to reproduce this in a laboratory, but they haven't been able to do that, despite all the time they've had, despite all the great equipment. And I think that's tremendous evidence that life can't evolve from a chemical soup. Many evolutionists admit that life from non-living chemicals is a huge problem for life on Earth. So they've resorted to the idea that maybe life came from outside the Earth, and this is called panspermia. Now, there are two versions of this one. One is undirected, which just says that chemical evolution happened somewhere and life was naturally seeded onto Earth somehow. Now, this doesn't actually solve the problem of life from the living chemicals. It just puts it into the unknown. In fact, it puts it beyond science. So you might say it's a Darwin of the gaps theory, not science at all. Another idea is called directed panspermia, where you have intelligent aliens seeding life from outer space onto Earth. Francis Crick, the primary discoverer of DNA, is one of those scientists who realized it can't happen spontaneously. So he, like other scientists, are imagining that intelligent life from outer space brought life to Earth. And they find that more credible than the idea of spontaneous origin of life. Evolutionists who resort to directed panspermia are in fact tacitly conceding that life was intelligently designed. The only difference is their design is an alien, not the God of the Bible. Of course, this is most convenient for them because a the God of the Bible has certain moral requirements while aliens don't. So they can have all the benefits of a designer without the moral obligations to him. Studying the origin of life is totally ridiculous in the light of our modern understanding of the most simple living cells and what it needs. I was in a meeting recently where an origin of life scientist was telling about his studies and a professor next to me whispered to my ear, what on earth does this have to do with science? The, this whole study of origins has more to do with history than science. We're told the fossil record is supposed to be a record of evolutionary history on earth, but notably absent from any rock anywhere is any trace of a primordial soup. If Chemical evolution occurred over millions of years, and if rocks form slowly and fossils accumulate slowly, there should be a record of this somewhere in the fossil record. people seem to believe that fossils take a very long time to form, thousands, millions of years in order to form, but the existence of a fossil by itself is actually proof that something happened very, very fast. When an organism dies, there's all parts of the environment that are trying to destroy it. There's the weather, there's erosion, there's scavengers and other animals that are going to come and tear apart your fossil. But as soon as the organism dies, if it's covered by sediment, and protected from the environment, then the process of fossilization can start. And we know from modern examples that fossilization, as far as converting the bone or the shell into rock, can actually happen very, very fast, in a matter of months. Since we know that fossils have to form quickly in order to become fossils at all, we also know, therefore, that the rocks that the fossils are formed in must themselves have been formed quickly as well.
So creationists who study the geological record and the geological column can agree with some of our evolutionary colleagues on something, the order of the fossils. But what we're going to disagree with is about the ages that my evolutionary colleagues ascribe to those rocks, not the order of them themselves. Charles Darwin said the fossil record would show evolution, but in fact, at the time, it didn't. And he predicted it would, but you know, it doesn't. And the prediction that he made has not been borne out by research since. We've found millions of fossils, and we do not find the fine gradation of change of one basic kind to another. And in fact, it's a huge problem for the whole idea of evolution. It is the big level differences between animals, these phylum level differences, that should give us our best example of evolutionary transitions. You need more transitions in order to split from something like a jellyfish into something like an arthropod, like a lobster. It's precisely these big level differences that have the smallest amount of evidential basis for Darwinian evolution. One of the most intractable problems in paleontology is one of Darwin's own devising. When Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, he knew of a group of fossils low in the geological column called the Cambrian. Since Darwin believed that all animals shared common ancestors, he believed that the animals in the Cambrian must therefore have ancestors in the rocks below them. To put the Cambrian explosion in context, let's think of Earth history like a football field. On an old age system, the beginning of the Earth at one end zone is four and a half billion years ago, and the present is at the other end zone. The Cambrian starts all the way across the field at the opposing team's 12-yard line and extends for one full yard. The Cambrian explosion, though, where we see the first appearance of all of these different animal body plants, these phylum-level divisions, happens in just four inches. It's not even the whole yard. So in the four inches that is the Cambrian explosion, this this narrow slice of time in geology, we have the first appearance of animals that are as different from each other as mollusks and clamshells from jellyfish. These are huge anatomical differences that are supposed to happen in a window of time where in other areas you're arguing about whether or not uh, humans and gorillas shared a common ancestor. A small difference anatomically compared to the huge body level uh, divisions that we see first appear in the Cambrian. But you know, there are no precursors to the Cambrian fauna in the Precambrian rocks. The Precambrian supposedly represents a couple of billion years of history, yet it shows nothing more than blue-green algae and bacteria, maybe a few other things thrown in late in the Precambrian. Yeah, so one thing we hear a lot is that maybe the ancestors of the Cambrian fauna were, were soft bodies, so they didn't leave any remains behind to be fossilized. And Darwin in The Origin of Species, he said, no organism wholly soft can be preserved. But that is nonsense, for even he knew fossil sand ripples and even raindrops were preserved in the rocks. And today, we have fossils of jellyfish, of worms, right from the fossil record. While the Cambrian explosion stands as strong evidence against evolutionary predictions, it's actually exactly what creationists would expect out of the fossil record. If Noah's flood created the bulk of our fossils and sedimentary rocks, then we would expect that as the flood starts in the ocean and drives its way on towards the continents, that it would pick up these marine ecosystems, burying them in sediment and driving them up onto the land where they would become fossilized and become sedimentary rocks. The thing about the Cambrian explosion that's so interesting is that when we look and see in those first four inches, when all these different animal phyla appear, it's a complex and complete ecosystem. This isn't a single organism that shows up and then later on another organism and then later another. It's an entire suite of organisms that were in one place, were catastrophically buried, and their remains were driven onto the continents. The basic features of the fossil record, a sudden appearance. There's an absence of transitions leading to the first appearance of a particular kind of animal. And the other feature is that fossils basically stay the same within their kinds. There might be some variations, but they're small compared with what is uh, to be anticipated if evolution from uh, amoebas to people happened. Evolutionists argue that the fossil record is incomplete, but this is no longer an adequate answer to this because we have millions of fossils that have been found. And the more fossils we find, the more clear it is that the transitions are missing. The idea of transitional species or missing links has been embedded in the public's mind for over 100 years. 
Most of the early finds have not withstood the test of time like Piltdown Man, Nebraska Man, and there are a lot of claims circulating today, but most of those, most of the current claims, fall into the creationist idea of variation within a kind. Um, if I were to pick three really famous fossils just from the last decade, I'd have to choose Ida, which was clearly a lemur, Puhila, which supposedly is the ancestor to seals, but which really looks like a modern otter, and Tiktaalik, which they tried to use as a club to beat the creationists over the head. But then some evolutionists found footprints of a four-legged animal in some rocks in Poland that the evolutionists had dated to millions of years older than Tiktaalik. So not only was Tiktaalik not transitional, but right now there's no candidate for that transition. What we do see is evidence for the creationist orchard where you get variation within a kind. You get a number of different horse species and these sorts of things. And so the horse fossil record fits in beautifully with the concept of a basic created horse kind developing into different species over time. Now throw into this mix what are called living fossils and the evolutionary picture gets quite fuzzy. Um, these are fossils that are allegedly millions of years old yet look extremely similar to the supposed descendants that are still alive today. We've got horseshoe crabs that have been around their basic configuration for what's claimed millions of years. Same with dragonflies, the coelacanth, and many, many other things. Now, if all these creatures have not changed over millions of years, where's the evolution? These cross supposed 500 million years of time, according to evolution. You have things like jellyfish and starfish and, and uh, all sorts of things that actually are the same today as in the fossil record hundreds of millions of years ago. And in that time frame, a worm has changed into you and me according to evolution, for which there's no fossil record showing that that happened. Now, a lot of people claim that maybe the animal is perfectly adapted to its environment, so it didn't need to change, but that is silly. I mean, some of those species have survived the greatest episodes of climate change and disaster in Earth history, like the supposed meteor that hit the Earth 65 million years ago and killed off the dinosaurs, or the end Permian extinction event where 99% of all species on Earth supposedly went extinct. There has been no constant environment in which to live in, during all of Earth history. So animals had to evolve to their surroundings in order to survive. But also, other species have supposedly been evolving ways to eat the older species. So how could they possibly have stayed the same as everything else changed around them? One major evolutionary icon is the alleged evolution of humans from ape-like creatures. But I don't know any paleontologist today that would be able to draw that smooth transitional series we saw in previous decades. There are so many supposed species on evolutionary tree of human history today, it's hard even to list them all. But let's just pick the most popular one, Neanderthal man. It was originally depicted as a half monkey, a distant relative, a real caveman. But today, everything has changed. Different paleontologists are trying to make the case that Neanderthal painted in caves, ceremonially buried their dead with their heads pointing towards the sunrise, made musical instruments, had the controlled use of fire, searched the landscape for rare minerals in order to make cosmetics. That is not the Neanderthal man I grew up with. And now that the genetics revolution is upon us, we've been able to construct five or six different Neanderthal genomes. There is strong evidence that modern man and Neanderthals interbred, meaning we are the same species by definition. Neanderthals are just a family group that lived in Europe and Asia after the flood. But the evolutionist says that these Neanderthal skeletons are tens of thousands of years old but we're still finding DNA in them? As a geneticist, that's not supposed to be. That is shocking, but what's even more shocking is finding soft tissues and fossils that are supposedly much, much older. For about a decade now, there's been mounting evidence of soft tissue that's still preserved inside dinosaur bones. Now, if these bones are supposed to be millions and millions of years old, the soft tissues like blood vessels and red blood cells and other materials should have long since degraded. But starting in 2005, with the discovery of a dinosaur leg bone from Tyrannosaurus rex, there were these different soft tissues that were in there, and they were still stretchy. A blood vessel that could actually be taken with tweezers and stretched out would snap back into place.
More material was discovered, different types of proteins have been identified in laboratories, and now there are mounting evidences coming in from a wide range of different types of fossil animals from the so-called age of dinosaurs. We've got Tyrannosaurus rex, Triceratops, a duck-billed dinosaur, uh, even eggs from sauropod dinosaurs, those are the long neck ones, uh, from China. And so with mounting evidence now from not only North America, and not just one unit in North America, but from multiple levels of rock in the, in the record, and from different continents, soft tissue is being identified more and more by more researchers in paleontology. In 2013, a remarkable paper was published documenting the discovery of bone cells and DNA from dinosaur bone. Now, they proved the DNA with three independent chemical tests, and they also found DNA in certain parts of the cell, which is just what we'd expect to find if it was in a cell nucleus. Also, they found proteins called histones, and that's where DNA is coiled up in dinosaur cells. They would not be found in bacteria, so this rules out contamination. So the recent experiments on how fast DNA breaks down shows that even under ideal conditions, it would not last anywhere near the time since dinosaurs were meant to have become extinct. These ideal conditions are temperatures well below freezing. Now, in real life, dinosaurs were meant to have lived in very warm climates, and warmth means that DNA would decay even more quickly. Therefore, uh, the presence of DNA in dinosaur bones is very strong evidence against the millions of years time scale. 150 years after Darwin, the transitions are still missing, and the fossil record still doesn't reflect evolution over billions of years, but the rocks in which the fossils are found are often used as evidence for billions of years of time. Originally, the early geologists believed the Bible and they took the biblical account of history as being what really happened. And so based on that, they came to the idea that things happened quickly during the creation and the flood. They even developed some geological histories based on that idea. Later on, at the very turn of the 19th century, you start to get people who are arguing the geological processes from the rock record can only be explained using processes that we see around us today in the world. And so when we see people like Hutton or Lyell who argue for what's now called uniformitarianism, they would look at the geological events that were happening in the world, say how often a river flooded and how much sediment it deposited in its floodplain. They would then say, okay, if there's one inch worth of sediment that was deposited this year and next year there's another inch, then when I look at the geological column and I see a rock unit that looks kind of like a flood zone uh, of a river, I should only use the rates that I see today in the modern realm to estimate the amount of time that it took to create that rock. From a myriad of different philosophical and theological reasons, 
uniformitarianism uh, took over the place of catastrophism as they argued effectively in many cases that catastrophes, which are not greatly experienced in a day-to-day -day realm, could not be applied to the geological record. Their arguments, I think, were wrong, but they were effective and they won the day. And it would be over a hundred years that a strict view of uniformitarianism, that slow rates and gradual processes, could be the only explanations in geology. It wouldn't be until the middle to late 1900s that we start to see geologists uh, prying themselves from the shackles of uniformitarianism and allowing catastrophes to get a place back in geology. It's not as far as uh, we would like, it's not Noah's flood, but they're starting to recognize that catastrophes do most of the work in geology. Glacial erosion is usually associated with smooth surfaces and grooves left by the glaciers themselves. But there is another erosional feature which is very interesting, namely what happens to the meltwater that accumulates at the foot of the glaciers. It sometimes bursts as channelized flow, like huge torrents. As they move fast and they carry a lot of sediments with them, they are capable of cutting gaps like this one in this ridge. So this was a continuous ridge which was literally cut by the torrent that came from underneath the glaciers. In 1980, there was a, an eruption of Mount St. Helens, and uh, from this single eruption, a pyroclastic flow, that is a flow of hot gas and ash, uh, as it erupted, it left behind some 25 feet, uh, some eight meters of sediment, which was finely layered, and uh, this was uh, deposited in a very rapid time, less than a day. From what was learned at Mount St. Helens, we can now understand that there's all sorts of geological processes that can happen in the blink of an eye. From the formation of layered sedimentary units, we can find that there are tens of feet of rock unit that can be formed with fine laminations and thin layerings in between them, be formed in a matter of days. The erosion of small canyons that are like miniature laboratories for understanding how larger canyon systems like the Grand Canyon or the other large canyons of the American Southwest have been formed. Those formed in one case a day, in another case a couple of months. These processes give us a window into understanding the larger scale catastrophes and help us model these larger scale catastrophes when we try and apply our knowledge of geology to Noah's flood. As a geologist, trying to wrap my mind around how much energy Noah's flood actually produced is, is even hard to do for me. But one thing that creation geologists recognize is that the modern catastrophes that we have, while they give us a, a tiny glimpse, they really don't come close to the scope and scale of the energy that's being released during the flood. As the fountains of the deep, great deep break open, this means that the earth itself is being fractured, broken mashed and continents are moving vertically, horizontally, moving around with respect to one another. And as a result, tsunami after tsunami after tsunami keeps hitting the continents and driving floodwaters over top of them. The rain is unending. The energy to produce earthquakes and various types of geological catastrophes would be without parallel in the modern world. And so right now we look at the movement of the continents and it's very, very little. But during the flood, we're not talking about continental drift anymore. We're talking about continental sprint, where the continents are moving at rapid paces, 
through the flood waters and causing all sorts of geological havoc. During the singular event of Noah's flood, catastrophic plate tectonics predicts that the pre-flood ocean crust would be dragged down into the mantle in a process we call subduction. Because that happened very recently, only a few thousands of years ago, the cold ocean crust should still be cold even though it is descended into the deep, hot mantle. Modern seismologists have discovered that there are indeed huge, big, cold slabs of rock down near the core of the Earth itself in areas that should have warmed up if millions and millions of years worth of time were what has brought those slabs down instead of Noah's flood. The fact that we have cold slabs of rock is a confirmation of flood geology, not of old age geology. Another amazing prediction that has been confirmed in catastrophic plate tectonics is rapid magnetic field reversal. The Earth's magnetic field draws our compass needles towards north, but sometimes in Earth history, it draws it towards the south. Old age geologists believe that magnetic reversals have been happening for hundreds of millions of years and would have taken thousands of years to occur. Ironically, it was actually old Earth geologists working in the Pacific Northwest that found confirming evidence in support of rapid magnetic field reversals that are required for Noah's flood. They were taking a look at lava flows and looking at lava flows that would only take a couple of weeks in order to form. They took measurements of the skin of the lava to see the magnetic orientation. They were expecting to see almost no change as they went deeper into the uh, lava where the interior should shift only slightly. Instead, what they found is that the outside skin of the lava pointed north and the inside pointed south. So we have confirming evidence from lava flows that the switch of the magnetic field has to happen rapidly, which is exactly what flood geologists expect. It's amazing to think we can find marine fossils like algae in the very lowest rocks in the geologic column, and marine fossils on top of the highest mountains like Mount Everest. Well, how did they get there? Well, evolutionists would say that slow, gradual uplift over millions of years led to the formation of the mountain ranges and pushed the fossils up along with them. But there are some things about modern mountain belts that we see that don't seem to fit with this conventional view. Rock is brittle. It doesn't bend very easily. If you try and bend it, it breaks. Now, granted, on a big scale, you might be able to get some pretty big bends out of a large rock. But these bends are tight and close, and you can walk from one end of them to the other. This type of bend and folding without breaking the brittle rock uh, means that maybe it wasn't brittle rock at the time of its formation. These might have been much softer materials. After all, they were laid down during Noah's flood. They've been compacted down, started off horizontal, but then as the tectonic movements occurred, they shifted and folded them while they were probably still soft. So when we look at it this way, what we realize is that the really tall mountain chains, the Alps, the Rockies, the Himalayas, they didn't exist before the flood. The whole reason that they exist is because of the flood. Basically, when we look at the geology of the Earth, we find that present processes do not explain what we see. Rather, what we see points to catastrophic processes in the past, and when we think about what those could be, it fits exactly with the account in Genesis of Noah's flood, which destroyed the whole Earth. The flood wipes away millions of years from the geological record. Those millions of years are necessary for evolution to occur. No millions of years, no evolution.
many people are of the opinion that scientists can make direct measurements using these techniques of billions of years' ages for rocks. And they use this then to discredit the history of the Bible. And this is really not the case. The physics behind radiometric dating is relatively straightforward. We have a radioactive element called a parent, which transforms over time into a non-radioactive element called the daughter. And this happens with a characteristic rate referred to as a half-life. That's the length of time that it takes half the parent element to transform into an equal amount of the daughter element. So over time, the amount of parent in the rock decreases and the amount of daughter in the rock increases. The scientists can use very powerful machines to measure either directly the amounts of these two elements or their ratio, and this ratio then can be used in a theoretical calculation along with the half-life to calculate an alleged age for the sample. Let me give you some examples. Radioactive carbon-14 decays to nitrogen-14. Uranium decays to lead. Potassium-40 decays to argon-40. And all of these are used in radiometric dating. We don't actually measure the age with these methods. We actually are measuring the amount of these isotopes in the rocks or fossils. And it's an interpretation using certain assumptions about these amounts that give us the age. But the age is actually not measured directly. For many radiometric dating techniques, one of the assumptions is that there is no daughter element present in the rock when it is formed. Which, of course, we can't know unless we're actually there and can take a sample of the rock immediately after it was formed and do an analysis. Now, a small amount of daughter uh, present at the time the rock is formed, if the rock is actually billions of years old, will not have a very significant impact on the calculated age. But if the rock is actually only a few thousand years old, even a very, very tiny amount of daughter present at the time the rock is formed will have a huge impact and give the rock appearances of being billions of years old. Another assumption in radiometric dating is that the rate at which the parent element transforms to the daughter element has been constant over time. Now this has generally been borne out by experiments in the past, but recently some scientists in the US and Europe determined that the transformation rate of at least some elements, notably cobalt-60, cesium-137, silicon-32, and radium-226, do indeed vary with time. Now, they don't understand why this is, but they have noted that the rate varies with the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Now, the importance of this with respect to radiometric dating is that the assumption that the transformation rate is constant is clearly not true in the short term, and therefore may well be not true in the long term, which of course would invalidate the calculated ages. Some additional evidence for this is an experiment that was spearheaded by the Institute for Creation Research in which some scientists found zircon crystals with unexpectedly large amounts of helium in them. Now helium is a byproduct of the decay of uranium-238 to lead-206. And based on the ratio of lead to uranium in these zircon crystals, the calculated radiometric age was one and a half billion years. But helium escapes from these crystals very quickly. So if the crystals really were one and a half billion years old, then essentially all of the helium should have escaped. So the large amounts of helium that were found indicate that the crystals can't be one and a half billion years old, and maybe the transformation from uranium to lead 206 was faster in the past. A third assumption is that the rock has remained a closed system from the time of its formation. What that means is that no parent element or daughter element has been either added to or removed from the rock during its history by any number of potential chemical or physical processes. For radiometric dating to be valid, all of these assumptions must be true. If they are not, the results are not reliable. The standard way that an old age geologist provides a date for a fossil, say that dinosaurs died out 65 million years old, is not by dating the fossil itself, but by dating the rocks that are nearby the fossil and using the dates of the rocks as a bracket. They'll use radioactive dating methods to say that this rock is 65 million years old, there's dinosaurs underneath them, therefore the dinosaurs can be no younger than 65 million years old. An interesting question to ask would be whether or not radioactive dating methods that are applied to the fossils 
actually correspond to the radioactive dating methods that apply to the rocks. If the two are in agreement, then perhaps an old age geologist has a strong argument for the age of fossils. But if you get two different ages for things that are supposed to be the same age, then either one is right, the other is right, or neither one is correct. Many people think carbon dating can be used to date things that are millions or even billions of years old. However, because of its half-life, carbon dating can only be used theoretically to date things that are at most a few tens of thousands of years old. Because after that length of time, so much of the carbon-14 is decayed that there's not enough of it left to be detected, even with today's modern instruments. If the whole Earth was pure carbon-14, it could only last about a million years before it's all gone and we couldn't detect it. And yet, we repeatedly find carbon-14 in objects which are claimed to be millions and even billions of years old, including diamonds. But the fact that we're finding carbon-14 shows they can't be millions or billions of years old. So carbon-14 is in fact a very strong ally of the biblical timescale and strong evidence against the millions of years of evolution. What dating of fossils has shown us over time is that there is carbon-14 in the fossil material. This is true whether or not they are fossils of mosasaurs, or fossils of seashells, or fossils of petrified wood, or any of the varieties of fossil fuels that we have, especially coal and oil and natural gas. Samples of these have been analyzed since the 1970s and consistently show us ages that there shouldn't be if they were in fact millions of years old. Coal is a particularly interesting case for carbon-14. Coal is the remains of plants that have been compressed, and so they were part of the ecosystem and had an active connection to carbon-14. It's found globally, and it's found throughout the geological record. When creation scientists sampled coal seams from different places and analyzed them for the amount of carbon-14, they found that regardless of where they were collected or from what layers of geology they were found, they all registered statistically the same amount of carbon-14. So with the coal seams, rather than providing evidence of gradual deposition and formation of coal over tens or hundreds of millions of years, the identical amounts of carbon-14 in all of the samples that were collected actually shows that they were all buried within the recent past. Even though radiometric data seems like a very scientific process, we've seen from measurements that it produces highly erroneous results. And due to the unknowable assumptions that are behind its normal application, it is unreliable and untrustworthy in many cases. You know, the Big Bang is often presented as though it's uh, a done deal, that it's uh, well understood, that the evidence uh, all points uh, inexorably to this, um, this whole picture of, of the past and vast millions of years and so on. The Big Bang uh, is uh, supposedly based on the idea that uh, when we observe the universe around us, we see that the galaxies and stars are all receding from us. Now, if you were to wind that backwards, it looks like it would all condense down into one place and people can figure out that it would have, you know, 14 or 15 billion years ago, it all exploded and now what we're seeing is the aftermath. But it turns out that, in fact, the Big Bang um, fails to explain the observations in a number of very fundamental ways. We are told today we live in a universe that's made up of 96% of stuff we know nothing about. We are told that 4%, the other 4%, which we do know about, is the stuff like normal matter, the chairs we're sitting on, the room, the earth, the solar system, everything we can see is normal matter. The rest is this dark matter and dark energy. Stephen Chu, the energy minister, Obama's energy minister, speaking at an Australian Institute of Physics conference to high school students, says, quote almost, 
we know nearly everything we need to know about the universe except for a few small details. What is dark energy and what is dark matter? It's 96% of the stuff of the universe we know nothing about. <laughs> Cosmology is not real science in the sense of regular, repeatable, testable science. Because cosmology is about a one-off event, supposedly the Big Bang. It happened one-off in the past. We can't repeat it. We've got no other universe to test it with. We've only got this one universe. So really, cosmology falls out uh, of the definition of real science. The universe, according to Big Bang, had an origin in time. They say it's only 13 billion years old. Therefore, we can only see, at most, 13 billion light years. This means we only can see a drop in the ocean. You have to make massive assumptions about the rest of the universe. And what if, what if we just happen to be living in a little local bubble and the rest of the universe was totally different? Many people uh, say that creationists have a, an issue with light travel. That is, how can we see light from distant stars when the Earth is only 6,000 years old. But the Big Bang, in fact, has its own light travel problem. This has to do with the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is supposedly the afterglow of the Big Bang, and, and which has been observed to have a very uniform temperature no matter where you look in space. And there just hasn't been enough time for the energy to be transferred across space to make all this temperature uniform to the extent that it is. And that's called the horizon problem. Now, there was an interesting uh, explanation or um, uh, attempt to, uh, to, to find a solution to this, and uh, it's called the inflationary period. So some incredibly short instant after this initial Big Bang, the universe expanded by massive orders of magnitude, and then somehow this, this uh, period of inflation, as it's called, stopped. So it starts for no particular reason, and it stops for no particular reason. And by the way, during it, gravity has to work in reverse. So rather than matter being attracted to matter, it has to repel it. And so there's this amazing story is told to try and patch up this glaring problem that the Big Bang has. The inflation proponents have no good physical model for this faster than light expansion. It's a fudge factor. But the Bible teaches several times that God stretched out the heavens. The uniformity of background temperature is consistent with the universe being upheld by a single creator outside time and space. Furthermore, it's not just a God did it explanation. Creationist physicists have developed multiple competing models of this expansion using Einsteinian general relativity. The Big Bang model basically says that high redshift objects are distant, low redshift objects are nearby. Astronomers like Alton Arp and others have found many, many exceptions to this case where they've found high redshift quasars physically associated with low redshift galaxies. And when I say physically associated, I mean we see bridges of stars and gas connecting the two x-ray emitting gas. Uh, it is one very famous case, NGC 7319, where we find a high redshift quasar in front of an active low redshift spiral galaxy, which should not happen in a Big Bang universe. There's something wrong. There's a serious problem that has to be answered. There are a lot of these anomalies where you have objects with vastly different redshifts that are somehow connected with each other. This should not be possible if redshift was a measure of distance. But clearly they are connected, which means that the standard interpretation of redshift is wrong, and this undermines the Big Bang itself. If the theory is the incorrect description of what we observe, when we try to apply it to what we observe, we'll have to make up fictitious entities to make the theory fit. Dark matter is invoked to explain peculiar motion in spiral galaxies and in, in clusters and so on. Uh, dark energy is used to explain this anomalous acceleration of the universe when they use these bright supernova light sources. And inflation is used to smooth out the universe, to make it appear the way we see it today. But these unknowns are not experimentally verified and, and, in my opinion, never will be. 
The Big Bang Theory has a number of secular objectors. In 2004, 33 of these cosmology dissenters wrote an open letter published in New Scientist, and over 100 more cosmologists have added to this letter. And they said, among other things, an open exchange of ideas is lacking and doubt and dissent are not tolerated. In no other field of physics would this continual recourse to new hypothetical objects be accepted as a way of bridging the gap between theory and observation. So you might ask this question, why with all the modern technology, supercomputers, we have large telescopes with adaptive optics, we have space telescopes, why haven't we found the observational evidence to firmly establish the Big Bang without invoking all these unknowns? To believe in the Big Bang, you have to take it on faith. There's certain things you have to assume as given, without which you can't even make a calculation. How do you get to the ludicrous situation of 96% of the universe made up of stuff we know nothing about? Cosmology is not experimental science. In fact, I would go so far as to say cosmology is not even science. It's a philosophy, it's a religion, a worldview, it's a belief system. It's not science at all. I would say that the grand theory of evolution is a mixture of science and philosophy. And the philosophy is more dominant nowadays than the science. Science is used to back up the philosophy and naturalism. What I find is that most people, most evolutionists, have never critically examined their own position. It's such a sacred cow, even in their own minds, it's unthinkable to start examining the weaknesses. It's an amazing stronghold. And so I guess I'm trying to suggest why the de creation evolution debate isn't uh, the sort of logical argument that you'll get among scientists when they're discussing, say, the role of sunlight in triggering flowering. But with the creation evolution issue, uh, if Evolution is not true, then it means we're created. And if biblical creation is true, then it means it's the God of the Bible to whom we are accountable to. And that, for many people, is a no-go zone. You know, if you want to consider yourself part of the intellectual elite, you must be a Darwinist. It's that simple. It's like, it's like um, the fee you pay to get into the club. And so this is a very, very strong motivator. And there's a flip side to that, which is if you don't hold it, you are, will be ridiculed and treat it as if you're really stupid and really ignorant. And so the fear of ridicule is just palpable on campuses. There are many, many scientists who actually realize they, that there are major problems with Darwinian theory, but they are silent because they know if they speak their doubts, they will get in trouble. They won't get grants, they won't get funding, they won't be politically correct, they won't have friends. All the, all the stuff that makes for academic success goes away if you question Darwin. So if evolution is true, many honest evolutionists acknowledge there is no rational basis for morality. It opens up the prospect of um, all sorts of things like uh, what, what really is ultimately wrong with abortion. Um, I mean, after all, if you've uh, got an unwanted pregnancy, why not terminate it? What does it really matter, ultimately? Um, what if someone is old and unproductive? 
Uh, they're, they're a burden on society. Society has to support them, feed them, care for them. Uh, why not just help them along the way, get rid of them, you know? Now, there's some moral implications there. If the Creator made us, then He owns us and has a right to make the rules for us. But if we things made themselves, then there's no right or wrong. We're just really bags of rearranged pond scum. So what is murder? It's just one bag of chemicals impacting another bag of chemicals. Science can't tell you that murder is right or wrong. It can tell you that this action will kill something. It won't tell you that it's right or wrong. This issue of evolution affects so many things in people's lives. It affects the way they feel about themselves. It affects the way people treat one another. It affects their attitude to uh, motivation for living. It affects the way, the way they regard law in their country. It affects the value that they place on other human beings. Now, many critics of Christianity point to various religious wars, the Crusades, the Inquisitions. Now, first of all, uh, these people were acting inconsistently with the teachings of Christ. Second, the numbers are minuscule compared to the atrocities committed by atheist regimes in the 20th century. Now, evolution has been used as a basis for society, and that society was the society of Nazi Germany. Now, Hitler was definitely trying to put Darwin's ideas into practice, like the idea of survival of the fittest, which means death of the unfit. Hitler believed that some races were more highly evolved than others, but the Jewish race was uh, subhuman, he believed. And so if we take the ideas of evolution, we attempt to apply them to ourselves, uh, the result is not pretty. It's hideous. Uh, it's evil. Now, I'm actually Jewish ethnically, and of course, my people were almost wiped out in Europe. Six million of us were butchered by this evolutionary philosophy. And handicapped people were thought of as being less than human. Um, Hitler's own propaganda films said, we have sinned grievously against the law of natural selection by allowing the handicapped people to live. Menschen haben gegen dieses Gesetz der natürlichen Auslese in den letzten Jahrzehnten furchtbar gesündigt. Wir haben unwertes Leben nicht nur erhalten, wir haben ihm auch Vermehrung gewährt. Die Nachkommen dieser Kranken sahen so aus, in denen tausende lallende Schwachsinnige künstlich ernährt und gepflegt werden müssen, die tiefer stehen als jedes Tier. So Hitler replaced the Judeo-Christian ethic of sanctity of innocent life made in God's image with an evolutionary ethic uh, that whatever's good for the evolution of the master race is good for society. After the war, the leading Nazis were put on trial, but some of them claimed they did nothing wrong because the laws of our country said it was okay to kill Jews. So on what grounds can you put them on trial? Only if there's a higher morality than national law. But where can this morality come from if they're not from the creator of humanity? If we just rearrange pond scum, there's no such thing as a higher law. Mankind is capable of doing all sorts of evil against other men. And to think that we might have kind of gotten this out of our system or that we're uh, structured our societies in ways that this can't happen again is naive. If powerful people take on ideas that are poisonous, the result is the death of people. The last century was the most bloodstained in all of human history. And this was not due to religious wars, some people like to point to. It was at the hand of genocidal, mass-murdering governments led by men like Hitler and Stalin and, and Chairman Mao and Pol Pot. Now, all of these regimes had one thing in common, and that was a devout belief in evolution. This caused them to view people as nothing more than animals to be culled. I mean, Mao regarded himself as a disciple of Darwin. Hitler even wrote that, struggle is the father of all things. He who does not want to fight in this world where eternal struggle is, is the law of life has no right to exist. Now, a lot of people say this is maybe stretching things too far, but what if you were one of the ones consigned to the gulags or the gas chambers or the firing squads? and you also believed in evolution, what basis would you have for saying that they were wrong or acting inconsistently 
for what both of you believe. But have we really learned from history? Because the same philosophy behind Nazi Germany, which is evolution, is now being mandated in the government schools across the nations in the Western world. So should we be surprised that some of the consequences will also follow? Already we are having leading philosophers and so-called bioethicists talking about killing babies after birth if they're not fit enough. It's difficult to anticipate what any one society would do if it fully adopted an evolutionary view. Because if you try and derive morality from the animal kingdom, for example, there are all sorts of moralities that you might choose. Because when we look to the natural world to define a morality statement, what we find is that all sorts of different animals make their way in the world by doing all sorts of different things. While there's beauty in nature, there's also horror. I mean, as Tennyson wrote, it is red in tooth and claw. Darwin realized this, and that, that seems to be behind his rejection of a belief in an altruistic God in heaven. But it's not only in the natural world we see these horrors, there are also human-inflicted terrors that can be even on a mass scale. So seeing these two types of evil should cause a revulsion in people. The reality is, it should cause us to stop and realize that something is actually wrong. It shouldn't be like this. No one is really reconciled with death. Yet evolution says it is all perfectly normal. One of the biggest problems people have with the God of the Bible is that if there's a God of love, how come there's so much death and suffering in the world? Now, the Bible explains this because death and suffering in the Bible is a result of man's rebellion against their Creator. But evolution says that death and suffering are a natural part of what produced man in the first place. So evolution provides no comfort for those who are, who are suffering because suffering, sorry, is part of life is part of a struggle for existence. There's another reason why uh, an evolutionist will hold on to their belief system, even when all the fatal flaws are revealed. And that is because if evolution isn't true, it strongly points them in a different direction. Because really, if the universe and life didn't self-create, if it didn't happen spontaneously, then there has to be a creator. And the creator is not likely to be some little green man from another galaxy. The creator is gonna be almighty God. And so if God is truth, I'm going to try and orient my life in ways that conform with that. Whether that's the way I treat my wife and my children as a father and as a husband, uh, whether that's the way I treat my old age and evolutionary colleagues, with the utmost of respect because I believe that they are people that are made in the image of God. They're no different from me. They're no different from anyone else that I know. And when we start off with that idea that God made all people and that he cares for all people, if we let that sit in our hearts for a little while, it really affects the way that we treat everyone we come in contact with. Salvation doesn't result from intellectual activity. It doesn't come about through figuring out God or theology, uh, it is a spiritual transaction. So for me, when I understood that God made a perfect creation, there was a literal fall, and that now God is uh, restoring us by the sacrifice of his son. It really transformed my faith. For although I was a Christian for 10 years, I was an incredibly weak Christian. And so every aspect of my faith was transformed by more fully submitting to God and believing his word. 